Hello and welcome to another episode of my Mostly Stock career. Today we're going to be starting off right with landing on the moon. Now, when you actually go to land on the moon, you basically need to take your... It's the reverse of getting to orbit. You need to take your orbit and remove all of the delta V from it. So if you look at my current speed, it's about 491 meters per second of delta V. I have to cancel that out, and then I have to cancel out the effects of gravity. Which meaning, because I'm about 82 kilometers up, I have to cancel out 82 kilometers worth of falling straight at the planet. If I were to first cancel my just my orbit out. But what I'm actually going to do instead is because I want to land on the day side, I'm going to find the sun. I'm going to put a maneuver node on the opposite side of the planet. And then I'm just going to decelerate. Or I'm actually, my orbit's going in the other direction. Now, what I'm looking to do is take my periapsis and make it very low. Because, now normally you can land by just reducing your orbit until you actually see this thing touch onto the moon, which means that's where you're going to land. However, what I want to do instead of that is I want to make my orbit very, very low, and then actually proceed to cancel out the delta V when it's just barely above the actual surface level. Now this method does have a little more risk, meaning you can hit mountains or other high um, high peaks of terrain as you're coming in on this trajectory. However, it's also significantly more efficient. So what I'm actually going to do is kind of show you what I mean. What I'm going to do is just get rid of my node or ignore the node, I should say, and I'm just going to burn retrograde after quick saving because I want to show you kind of what happens when you try to land from a very high atmosphere. Now, I just tested the quick save and it worked successfully, so we're going to test this. Now, when you burn from a high atmosphere, you fall towards the planet for a very long time, and the longer you fall toward the planet, the more you accelerate towards it which means the more you have to slow down before actually reaching it, which makes it less efficient. So you're going to see me just burning retrograde until I fall to the planet and cancel out most of my orbital velocity. There, pretty much. Now, if you look at my current speed, it's still rising. This is because this is gravity's effect on me. Because at first all I did was cancel out my orbital velocity, I'm still 85 kilometers up. Meaning that if I time warp a little bit, by the time I actually get to the planet, I already have another 400 meters per second of delta V I have to cancel out already, and it's still going up, just to land. So this landing, having just canceled out my delta V from 85 kilometers until now, is going to cost me uh, 450, about 450 meters per second worth of delta V. Along with, if we uh, quick load that, 450 along with about 500. So about almost a thousand delta V for that particular landing. Now, how about we go until this maneuver node that I created and try this second form of landing? Because I believe that this second form of landing is going to cost much less than 950 to 1000 meters per second of delta V. Now, what this second form of landing is actually doing is it's lowering your periapsis to being just above the surface of the planet. What this does is it means that you're still technically in orbit, and because you're still technically in orbit, you're not falling towards the planet. So, because of this, all you have to do is cancel out your orbital velocity at the lowest point, and you fall towards the planet for a very short amount of time, meaning the planet's gravity only adds a very small amount of additional delta V that you have to use to land. That's basically why it's more efficient, because you're having to deal less with gravity, similar to why we burn at a 45 degree angle when getting into orbit versus burning straight up and then straight to the side. All right, so we have our periapsis set. And because I know on the opposite side of the planet, we are actually gonna be facing, basically our nav ball will swap rotations on the opposite side. I'm going to point prograde, which is going to turn into being retrograde. 
And about this time I noticed this craft doesn't have any power generation. So I'm just going to have to be wary of that and careful that I don't use all of it. So our first attempt at this costs over 950 delta V just to land, not to count that when I start when I start slowing down, gravity affects me longer, in which case it's actually going to cost more delta V. So my periapsis is, is 7,700, and I'm not going to want to stay in map view for this. I am definitely going to want to actually jump here into the normal view in case there's a mountain that I need to kind of dodge. So our first landing, like I said, cost about 950. We already spent about almost 500, just slowing down. So if we spend 500 to slow down, and it actually looks clear, so there's no worry about mountains or anything. Let's see how much we actually have to, or not 500, sorry, we took about 50 to slow us down. And now it's going to take us about another 600 for this burn. So once we got close to periapsis, all we're doing is going to cancel out all of our horizontal velocity. We're not going to worry about vertical velocity just yet, only our horizontal. I'm actually going to deploy my landing gears in preparation for this landing. Now if you notice, with surface mode enabled, you're going to see the retrograde vector move up the nav ball. Ignore that, just keep burning exactly on the horizon. That way you can cancel out your delta V, and once it starts going up, then that's when you stop. Because that means you're basically your vertical velocity is all that's left. So currently we've spent about 650 delta V, which means we still have another 300 before we're considered to be inefficient, or not to be as efficient as the previous example. So we're going to time warp a little bit, and you're going to notice we have 300 delta V that we can spend, and we're only moving about 100, 100 meters per second, which means Currently, we've saved about 200 meters per second. However, the original experiment wasn't actually uh, fully true because we would have to slow down and let gravity affect us longer, such as in this case, how I have to slow down so we don't crash. But the experiment still holds about the same true, saying that when you go lower and cancel out your delta V, it's much more efficient than canceling it out very high in the orbit. Now this is only to be said if you're not planning to basically crash into the moon. If you go from Kerbin directly onto the moon's surface with no um, plans of getting into orbit, then just crashing on the moon is more efficient because then you don't have to waste fuel getting into an orbit. So this terrain is actually really bad, so I'm going to move over here where the terrain is better. Just because I do want to land on something that isn't some giant cliff. So I'm just going to take it easy on the throttle because we don't need too much to move around the moon. And of course, let myself fall back down, nice and slow. Of course, pointing at my retrograde vector the entire time because that's where the velocity will actually cancel out. So this is still a bit steep, but we'll see what we can do with it. So it was much too steep, which is why I quickly burned very fast as to avoid crashing. Because the quick burn actually, instead of having me topple over, it allowed me to, of course, gain some altitude. Hopefully this area will be slightly better. I didn't get a very good landing spot. Yes, this is much flatter, so this should be fine. And we'll just touch down. And there we go, we have officially landed on the moon. Nice and efficient, although, like I said, because uh, you have to slow down, then that is a factor in it. But about 200 delta V difference, possibly more or less, give or take some. But that's quite significant when 200 delta V can be a uh, very small amount of fuel for some smaller craft. This is a pretty large um, craft here with a two and a half meter tank. 
but some smaller craft actually use a lot more. Now, I was talking about that this fuel tank had 3200 delta V in it, and currently we're at about a quarter, which means we have maybe 600 to 800 delta V left. I hope that's enough to get us back. I think it should be, but we'll just have to see. But now that we are landed, hopefully I can turn SAS off without this toppling over. Good. Which means now we can do all of our science from the moon's midlands. So we'll take a crew report. We're going to do our materials bay. For a hundred science, this is quite a lot we're going to be bringing back. We'll do our goo for another 40. As well as the thermometer for 32. And the barometer. Which I do like how they fixed this in 1.0 where they actually let you test it now, which you can see that there is no pressure, basically. Whereas previously it said this is an invalid experiment. When, what if there was just a millionth of a fraction of an atmospheric pressure on the moon? Well, you wouldn't know until you actually tested it. So we have that. We're going to EVA Val, who's going to fall, apparently. Luckily, the moon isn't too um, heavy on gravity, so she's not going to get any serious injuries. We'll take an EVA report. Can't take a surface sample yet because we haven't upgraded the astronaut complex, but we can plant a flag. Our first flag to be precise, and we will appropriately name it as first. So we will just take Val and bring her back into the ship so that we can start planning on how we're going to return. Now, if you notice that something that's weird is that this decoupler has removed its kind of shroud under the heat shield, and I'm not too sure why it did that, but when I reloaded this world after having saved and exited the game, it was just there. Or, it wasn't there, I should say. So I'm not too sure why that happened, although it doesn't affect anything, so I'm glad for that. So we already have an EVA report from the moon's midlands, probably when we were flying by it, and we did the EVA reports pretty low. So I guess we're not going to be getting any science from that. Now, I actually want to go back to the Space Center for this. Because at the Space Center, when you've landed on the moon, sometimes you'll get new contracts that say, like, get back from the moon or plant a flag on the moon. However, it doesn't appear as though we have any of those. Although there is apparently test the main sail. Now, I'm tempted to take this contract but not complete it since it lasts for uh, over a year. And the reason I wouldn't complete it is when you actually test these parts, you gain access to the part for the testing, but you can use that part on any vessel. However, I do want to do this just to see if completing a contract is going to refresh the contract list to see if I get anything new in the uh, contract menu. So you can see we have a main sale. And we're just going to literally test it. I have no intention of taking off, so I'm going to put a pretty harsh thrust limiter on it, just because I don't want the little bit of throttle I'm going to put on this thing to actually cause it to go up too fast. There we go, we ran the test, which of course is just basically activating the engine. So we'll just recover this. Now like I said, I'm trying to get it to refresh the contract list. Sometimes completing contracts will do that. Which is a good thing because maybe I'll get something from the moon that I can do before I come back. Well, there is a new contract, however it's for Minmus. So... So just like with the main sale, there's another experiment that I grab which is testing two SRBs. So, we hop into the VAB, and all we really do is put them opposite of each other on a vessel and limit their thrust and solid fuel in them so that they don't actually take off. And just for safety measures, I decide to make it so there's, there's not a Kerbal in case they explode, and put a clamp down just to ensure they don't fly away. And then it's just up to testing them, which I complete two more contracts in hope of, of course, getting a different moon contract I can do while I'm landed, and we'll see what we get. Here we go, science data from the surface of the moon. 
This is what I was looking to actually get. Transmit or recover scientific data from the surface of the moon. Well, we got an EVA report from the surface of the moon. So we'll take that and that'll just kind of auto-complete on our way back. And I believe that that is all we have. Now I did have to use a lot more fuel on that landing because the landing site was pretty poor. Although hopefully it won't affect our ability to get back. I'm pretty sure that we have enough to get into orbit at least. Uh, as far as getting back though, I'm not too sure. But if we can get to orbit, then it's easy enough to launch a rescue. So that's kind of my goal, get to orbit. And if we can't get to orbit, then I guess we'll just have to bring a rescue down here. So for the most efficient way of getting back to Kerbin, actually, based on our current position, if you look, now this is kind of like what I was talking about a little bit last time when we did the flyby. If you look, going straight up from the moon, straight away from the center of gravity, is to move in this direction. Which means when we move in this direction, we're moving retrograde to our orbit around Kerbin. So, in truth, the most efficient way to just kind of leave the moon for us would be to go straight up as quickly as possible. Because not only will we be leaving the moon, but we will also start heading toward Kerbin. So you can see our periapsis is already going up. Let's actually lock that so we can look at our fuel. And it looks like we're going to be able to return because of how efficient we get to do our return. Since we don't have to get into orbit, we can just burn straight up and away from the moon and then automatically return to Kerbin. So, of course, because this, we're going to be moving in pretty fast toward Kerbin, we're going to have a rather high periapsis. 30 kilometers should be fine. And now we just have to wait. And I'm actually going to wait for this second orbit to happen once we leave the moon's sphere of influence to do my science transfers. Just so that we're not so close to the moon. So this is all stuff we've seen. Of course, now that we have our basically our re-entry of the atmosphere of Kerbin, we're going to hop out here and grab all of our science from both the materials bay as well as our goo experiment and the barometers and temperature scans. Now what happened there was I lost control because I bumped Valentina's head on the craft and the camera angle started acting really weird. Anyhow, switching vessels gave me back control, so I hopped back in the vessel and of course we're going to finish our time warp to actually getting to Kerman's atmosphere, where I do something rather stupid. I managed to actually, in an attempt to stage off the decoupler, which is already a part of the stage two, if you notice, or stage one, then I accidentally use my parachute instead of the decoupler. So we're actually going to have to deal with that, having have used this parachute early, and I'll kind of tell you how to secretly get through that. Okay, so I think I accidentally deployed my chute because my decoupler didn't actually work when I told it to decouple, which means with any luck, the chute won't open up until minimum pressure is really high. Which means, hopefully it won't open up until we're moving slow enough. As to not have it get destroyed. Which is also why I'm not dropping this bottom stage, because this bottom stage is giving us much more drag. Which means, hopefully it will slow us down more. Hopefully we don't have to kill Valentina, because parachute was wrongly staged, but we'll see. If you ever find yourself actually accidentally deploying your parachutes before you're um, in suitable speeds to do so, whereas I mean they would just burn up the second they actually deployed, just raise the minimum pressure because that will mean that they can't deploy until the minimum pressure has reached a very high value, which is only usually reached when you're really low on Kerbin. So as you can see, by now this chute would have deployed if I had kept it normal. And of course I can just dial it back in order to actually deploy the chute on time. So I'm actually going to decouple that because I no longer need it. Or really want it. Hopefully it won't hit us. That would be very unfortunate. Um, mostly I'm getting rid of it because it's 
pulling us down because of how heavy it is. Whereas it's no longer providing too much to the use of drag. And we've slowed down quite significantly. Which means I'm actually going to dial this back and hopefully it'll deploy. Either that or it's... yeah, like I thought. I was starting to question whether or not it was deploying because I had staged it back or because the minimum pressure was just not high enough. And as it turns out, because it just deployed when I dialed back the minimum pressure, everything I have been saying is right. I began to second guess myself for a moment. So there we go, we have our parachute, all of our science, and the knowledge of how to save our crafts if we accidentally deploy the parachute a little too early. Now that part crashed and something happened, as you can see. I'm actually curious, does this have... It has a fixed velocity. It's just ignoring physics. A uh, Kerbal Space Program can do that sometimes. So the small goo experiment is trying to get back to orbit with its fixed velocity. Uh, however, because it'll eventually leave physics range or will recover this vessel too quickly, it will never actually get there. So there we have it, our first successful mission to the moon, where we managed to get 326 science. As well as Valentina got three whole experience, which is actually really good. She'll probably level up pretty soon. We also completed a couple contracts, which is that science data from space around the moon that we got when we were in orbit, and the science data from the surface of the moon that we literally had just picked up when we landed. And now, of course, Plant the Flag on the Moon shows up. Apparently it wanted us to do that in a separate mission. We will be going back soon, pretty soon, so we'll be able to do that one then. But we have 390 science to spend, and I think that we should spend this before the end of this episode. And we actually can't get the next tier of rockets because we haven't upgraded the Research and Development Center yet. That's interesting. So the first thing we're definitely going to want to grab is some form of power generation because we currently don't have any and if we're going to keep doing missions far out in space we're going to need them. As well as I want the better landing legs just because they make landing a larger craft much easier. And I do like this Mark 1 lander can because it's lighter than the original one that you start with and it has both 1.25 meter connector nodes on top and bottom so it can fit in line better than um, being kind of forced to fit on top because of the 0.625 connector on top of the normal can. And for the final science that I'm going to grab, it's going to be propulsion systems because I do like these small, um, pretty efficient engines. Just because they work really well for tiny probes or Minmus landings, since you really don't need a lot of liquid fuel to land around Minmus. So we'll grab the small engines, and we're going to be left with 30 science. It would be nice if we could get another um, chunk of science, another 60 science, in order to buy another one of the researches. However, I don't think we're going to be able to just yet. So I'm just looking at upgrade prices. We do want to be able to do surface samples. I'm just trying to figure out which one allows us. Oh, it's the really, it's the Research and Development Center that allows you to do surface samples. That's peculiar. Now, it's a lot to upgrade that one, so I'm not sure if I want to upgrade it just yet. Or if I want to try and do some other experiments first. Now, I'm thinking of what to do here, and I'm remembering that I do have the scan that I still need to do from the previous episode where the plane wasn't able to complete its flight since it kind of exploded. And I'm wondering which contracts I can do in conjunction with that. And I'm thinking that ferry a VIP to his destination. Well, he wants a suborbital space flight on Kerbin. And I'm wondering if I can get into a suborbital space flight and then complete an orbit, does it still consider him to be happy with it? Or doesn't want me to just literally go into a suborbital flight and then land back down without doing anything else. 
So I'm wondering. How about we test it? We'll grab that. We're also going to grab rescue Mollen Kerman in orbit from Kerbin because we're going to rescue him when we go into orbit. And then we're going to come back down and complete the one that we weren't able to complete last time. And we'll see how this goes. However, I will have to cut myself off because we don't have enough time for that particular mission, so we'll just be doing it next time. I thank you guys for watching episode 5 of my Mostly Stock career. I'm PTT, GRW, signing out.